Hey, hey everybody, welcome to Question Barn. Uh, you know, the show where we hang out and we answer a couple of your questions. It should be fun. Uh, this is the third episode. I think I'm just going to put these on the internet. We're, I'm still kind of working on the uh, intro song to it, but they're starting to pile up. So maybe I'll just start releasing them and then... Uh, and then we'll uh, I'll, I'll start sticking in the intro when that's finished. All right, everybody. So uh, today joining me is is my old pal Mike Zemkoff. Hey, Mike. Hey. Um. So to start the show. We you got to talk about what's going on with you. What's what's new with you, Mike? Yeah. So we uh, we got this big result that's been in all the newspapers uh, about uh, the we looked in the near infrared with a sounding rocket experiment and the fluctuations are really, really bright. And we think it's because there's a lot more stars in between galaxies than we thought there were. So it's been kind of a big deal and I'll be on quirks and quarks. If people know what that is pretty soon. It's the Canadian, it's, it's the, the Canadian science show on, yeah. on the CBC. Yeah. And it's kind of a, a dream come true for science nerds who grew up in Canada. So that's fun. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, go look for that. It's it's a cool result. That's totally amazing, buddy. Oh man, I wonder why. Like that doesn't even make sense, right? Because you don't you don't, don't you usually need uh, parts of the galaxy that are like like stars form more preferentially in parts of the galaxy where there's big clumps of concentrations of uh, of dust and stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. So so the the model is that as galaxies. Uh, assemble and start merging and banging into each other. There's tidal stripping, yeah. so you get a bunch of material that gets flung out and it goes to very high radius or maybe even escapes the potential well completely. So, so the idea is that uh, over time and over lots of galaxies merging to make big galaxies, you you're flinging you know quite a lot of stars out relatively, and and they started just you know filling up the the filaments of structure in the universe and it's just filled with this diffuse starlight. Huh. Well, yeah, I think, I, I guess this result would, it, in addition to being totally crazy, it would also inform the rate at which galaxies merged and stuff, if that's the main mechanism, right? Yeah, yeah. So so people have known about tidal stripping and, and halo light forever and ever, but, uh, uh, you know, this is just saying that there's more stars in that than we thought and people who make models for the universe should probably be paying attention to where where this flung out mass goes to. That's pretty great. That yeah. It's pretty great. Well, uh, what's new with me? Not much. Uh, Halloween's over. Uh, it's Remembrance Day today. Uh, so I'm recording a podcast. Um, yeah, we, we have an extra long weekend. So I'm marking exams and sitting at home. Uh, I, I've been watching a miniseries, a cartoon miniseries called Over the Garden Wall that I really like. Not much to say in Kelowna. Life is pretty. Is fun. over the garden wall like? Is it for adults or for kids? It's kind of dark, but yeah. I think it's so. I think they play it in the played it played it on like the Cartoon Network and stuff pretty late in the evening. Uh, it's a little bit scary, but you know, I think I think plot wise, kids can take a lot of darkness in their cartoons. Like Disney movies aren't, you know, like parents die in Disney movies pretty much every minute. <laughs> right, so like uh, horrible things happen regularly in kids in children's programming. So even though it's it's a little bit emotionally dark, I think it's 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 pretty brave. It kind of it kind of feeds off a lot of the um, you know uh, like children's stories and stuff. It seems to, it's it's about two little boys. There's a teenage boy and his uh, little kid brother. And they've somehow become stranded in this magical woods, and they're trying to find their way out. But everything in it wants to eat them or suck their soul. But it's a miniseries, so it's 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 got a nice arc to it. Hmm. And every episode has a lot of uh, singing in it, and the and the music in it's quite good. So I, I yeah, I don't know. I'm a simple guy, man. I just want to watch my cartoons. Um, I hear that. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's start ta- answering questions. Uh, so this so Mike is a is is a is a pretty fancy cosmologist, by the way. Everybody, um, he he does all sorts of really cool stuff. But I couldn't really find any questions that that he could address specifically based on his expertise. But I found some questions anyway, and so we'll try to answer those questions, and we'll just have fun. All right, Mike. 
Yeah, great. Okay, so the first one is by Jeffrey, and he goes, Why is it when you're looking over a hot surface, the objects on the other side look wavy? Is the heat affecting the light, or is there something else? What do you think? That's a great question. Right, you're supposed to preface all these things with that's a great... No, I'm joking. Actually, that's a good physics question. Um, it's fun. Well, it's one of those questions where you take it for granted, right? I mean, even in, like, m- cartoons and movies and stuff, you can you can illustrate that something is really hot by having those wavy lines above it. Right. Right. But, you know, nobody ever tells you where they come from. And they should, because it's cool. Okay, so uh, I'll start, and then you jump in. The, uh, uh, basically what happens is air, the speed of light in air is not the same as speed of light in vacuum. It's a little bit uh, slower. Uh, so what happens is you get these kind of changes. The, the, the air itself has an index of refraction, which means that it, it affects how light angles, uh, how light bounces off stuff. And how light propagates in the medium. So what's happening with the hot air is that the index of refraction of hot air is ever, ever, ever so slightly different than the index of refraction for cold air. And when you have like a heater on, you're getting kind of waves of hot air off it. Yeah, well, then it's not just waves of hot air. You get convection bubbles of hot air, right? You get convection, yes. So it's like the, right. bo- you, you know, you take your hot water and you put it in a pan because <laughs> you need to heat it up even hotter. And you uh, you turn on the pan, and then the bottom of the pan gets these bubbles. Actually, before this, you can actually see these waves, these wavy lines happening before it. But yeah, oh, that's a good point. It happens in water too, doesn't it? Yeah, but I mean, it's just uh, it's just there are places where the water is hotter or the air is hotter than other yeah. places, right. uh, and it can either move up in bubbles or it can kind of stream or do whatever. Uh, and the moral of the story is because there's these difference in pressures. Uh, sorry, these difference in temperatures, uh, the, the density of the air is different, and so the index of refraction is different, and it ends up being, you know, it, it's like looking through, a, a, you know, like crappy windows from back in the day? Uh, modern plate glass is a pretty new uh, invention. Do you know how they make plate glass, Mike? No, it involves sand. No, it's it's pretty cool. There's like a, a a pool of liquid. I think I looked this up in the encyclopedia ten years ago. So uh, look it up on Wikipedia yourself if you want to know. But they pour it down on a liquid, and so they end up with this nice smooth rectangular piece of glass. But back in the day, they didn't have fancy industrial technology. So if they wanted to make a window, what they would do is they take essentially they, they were just glass blowers, right? So they would take essentially a sheet of, of, of molten plastic glass, it's, it's still really bendable, and they'd spin it. And you'd end up with a record kind of shape, a disc, and then out at the edge, the variation in the width would be fairly, uh, fairly flat. So, so the, the width wouldn't vary too much out at, near the edge. And so they'd cut their windows or their pieces of windows from this. Um, but the deal is that you don't get a perfectly uniform sheet of glass this way uh there are bubbles the the glass width is is different in different places and that's why when you look through a, an older or crappy window uh it it kind of distorts it lenses the image behind it right i also thought that glass is actually plastic no no it's or, not. Uh, yeah, liquid so that a, it it kind of melts that's an over urban hundreds myth. of years yeah is that right yeah oh. yeah it's an urban myth so what would happen is they would back in the olden days these hundreds of years old this is how they'd make the glass and so there would be a variation in the in the in the width of it um just naturally by 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 the way they were constructing it and then they just you know probably put the heavy side on the bottom and so they started out looking like this huh yeah I know, right? Anyway, well, I learned something. There, question barn. <laughs> yeah, strikes again. Way to go, barn the bunny. So th- <laughs> this is effectively what's what's happening inside your thing. The 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 uh, the optical width is is different because of these bubbles, where it's lighter. The the hotter air is less dense, so it refracts light, right? Yep. Presumably, yeah. Uh, okay, so we we got another question. That's a pretty fun one. Um, and, and and I was going through the questions that people have sent. By the way, you can send your questions to T-I-P-H-Y-T-E-R at titaniumphysics.com. Uh, the next question is, we've made maps of dark matter, of where dark matter is in galaxies. Do we have anything like that for dark energy? Uh, do we even know that it's expanding uniformly? Or if galaxies in one direction will accelerate away from us faster than galaxies in another direction? Uh, 
So that was a that was a fun question. Essentially, he's asking us. <clears throat> oh yeah, this is this is by a guy named uh, Logan. Uh, hey, hey, Logan. Uh, okay, so his question is: Is there any spatial variation in dark energy in the universe, and do we know what it is? Uh, what do you think, Mike? Well, so uh, uh, Ben and I were talking. This is a good question too, and and. You know, one of the problems with dark energy is that it's really early days and it's really hard to measure. And, you know, if we're measuring that it's the same halfway across the universe, right now we're doing a really good job. So this, the answer to this question is going to be entirely speculative because there's really no way to actually answer it based on measurements right now. Yeah, I, well, I mean, measuring these types of things is a fairly new field, right? Right. But, uh, but more to the point, you know, the galaxies which is basically how you're looking for this kind of effect. Uh, each have city in the universe, they're banging around, and, and you need a whole bunch of them to average it down uh, so that you can get to kind of one answer. So um, the, the tricky part here is to, uh, y- you know, you're asking about, you know, bumps on the size of who knows what, but galaxies, galaxy clusters, you know, pretty... Well, it's small compared to halfway across the universe. And so it's kind of hard to get to an answer in one of those little systems compared to how many you need to really understand this thing statistically. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Let's, so, quick review uh, dark matter is the matter we can't see. It doesn't interact with light. It causes gravity on the galactic scale to be much stronger than we think it would be, right? So galaxies rotate faster than they should, and we also detect it in cosmology when we do cosmology readings. So we know there's dark matter, but dark energy is a something that showed up just in cosmology, right? That's right. Um, so in essence, what's happening is the universe is expanding faster than we think it would, and its acceleration is expanding. So stuff is getting farther away from us faster, which is completely out of the blue. Nobody expected to see this. Um, so it's a fantastic result. Uh, our first episode actually was on um, big rips. So one of the candidates for dark energy is called phantom energy. And if the universe is full of phantom energy, then uh, the phantom energy will rip us to pieces one day. Um, but 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 uh, it, to 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 the to the question, um, there's there's a you know Mike and I are speculating right now because nobody knows at this point in time. We still don't have enough data. We're still trying to figure out what kind of variation the dark energy has over time, whether it's spreading out and becoming more diffuse or less diffuse or what, right? Um. So one of the ways we can do that, talking about how the, it, it it evolves in time, is to essentially look at galaxies and the farther they are away from us. Uh, the faster they're moving because of uh, the expansion of the universe, but also the farther away from there uh, they are, um, the, the 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 dynamics of the expanding universe are going to change over time. Um, so essentially, you look at galaxies farther and farther back, and you ask yourself, how fast are these receding from us? Because in addition to uh, their proper motion, because each galaxy will be kind of floating in its own direction randomly, uh, there is a motion which we interpret as a redshift, as a motion away from us, which is due to the expansion of the universe, in part from this dark energy. Right? Mm -hmm. So what we're we're seeing is that the the, the closer we look to us, I, I mean like on the very large galactic scales, we see that stuff is moving away from us faster than it should be closer in than, than farther away, farther That's back right. in time. Um, so so as, we, as we were speculating about this, yeah, we don't know. You know, there's, there's still kind of a... We still don't have enough and clear data. But in addition to this, when we look at individual galaxies, these, each galaxy kind of has its own proper motion. And it's hard to gauge whether or not the... the so, so this redshift effect... The expanding universe effect that, that that we that we can see through the data is kind of as, as it comes about as a matter of kind of averaging everything out that comes from a certain uh, time epoch, right? So so we can't see 
Oh man, I lost my train of thought. This is why I usually edit these things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can't. You can't tell whether or not a, a, a pocket of galaxies is moving away from us faster than it should be, just because it's moving away from us faster than it should be, or whether it looks like it's moving faster away from us because there's a little bit of dark energy nearby, causing expansion faster. Right. Right. And 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 the other component of this is if you think about it. On a on a sort of lower physics field kind of level, mm-hmm. um, the the dark energy looks like a pressure, and pressure fields you know they they push pushing out on each other, and and it sort of has of reducing uh, anisotropies, you know the blobbiness of whatever the field is doing. So you would imagine that even if this you know dark energy field started out kind of blobby. As the universe has expanded over time, that's kind of getting washed out because there's no way to kind of produce more bubbles, or at least not an easy way to produce more bubbles. Yeah, so bubbles in the early dark energy field would be caused by you know quantum mechanics during right. like the uh, the what's it called epoch the, of inflation. The inflation epoch, yeah, but they wouldn't be you know nothing nothing is poking it n- n- since, uh, right. and so we wouldn't see. Oh, right. So, okay. So what Mike is saying is that normal matter, essentially, one way to talk about this is that normal matter is gravitationally expansive, uh, sorry, is gravitationally attractive. So stuff's going to clump together into galaxies and stars and planets, right? Um, Yeah. This dark energy behaves in kind of a different way. I mean, it's causing the expansion of the universe. It's gravitationally repulsive. And so instead of clumping together the way matter has, or even dark matter has, what it's going to do is kind of expand. And if there's more of it in one place, it will cause a stronger expansion. And so it's going to spread out more. So naturally, you see kind of, you should see kind of a smoothness emerging from it over time. Well, anyway, and then the, yeah. the the third thing. Oh, a third thing. Well, okay. So if you think that the dark energy has something to do with the the zero point energy of vacuum. Oh, right. Those people. Right. Well, oh, so that's hard to reconcile right now. This is this famous hundred and twenty orders of magnitude in in energy scale problem, which is the the vacuum energy of the universe is big. And the energy of the dark energy, if you ask, like, what is it in a cubic meter in my office? It's teeny, teeny, tiny. Yeah. And it's hard to reconcile those two things. And people try and so on and so forth. But uh, the whole point of that is that if you think that dark energy is a quantum mechanical thing fundamentally, it's hard to get blobbiness in that. Because mm. quantum mechanics is so small and dark energy is so big. And, and it's just hard to make a way where you're producing fluctuations very right. easily. Right. Okay, let's let's talk about this for a second because this one's totally great. Uh it what it's like 120 orders of magnitude, right? Right. Okay, so the deal is uh the universe probably maybe has a cosmological constant. There is room in Einstein's equations of general relativity describing this cosmological constant, right? Um, And when you measure it, one of the biggest, best candidates for dark energy is this essentially constant. And what it is, is it's a constant curvature of space-time. It's like, imagine you were trying to, I don't know, um, tile the walls of your... Oh, imagine if you were trying to uh, tile the floor with Pringles. Uh, Pringles have a a constant curvature. They're saddle-shaped, right? Um so you would have the only thing you could you could tile using little pringle shapes there's something that has a saddle shape and so you end up with if you're going to build anything out of pringles it's going to have overall this great big saddle shape to its surface um so similarly einstein's equations allow the basic units of curvature of the universe the basic universe that you're you're allowed to make it have some constant curvature so this possibility for constant curvature is called the cosmological constant. It's really fun. Uh, nobody knows where it comes from or what the deal is, but it's it it could just be a constant of nature. Um, you know, I had a, a master's thesis advisor chide me once uh, for my my lack of imagination. 
when it comes to these things. I'm always like, oh, it's a constant of nature. And he's like, well, you know, if it's not, then you're missing out. <laughs> the 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 anthropic for the weak anthropic principle should always be your last recourse. <laughs> it should never be the first one, even though you think it's reasonable. That's that's definitely a <laughs> physics theoretician way of looking at it. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> So the uh, right, so quantum mechanics people, they, 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 people want to reconcile quantum mechanics with, with general relativity, and there's room in quantum mechanics for um, for vacuum energy. We've talked about it on the show several times. Uh, there's one on, on mirrors, I think, where we talk about the Casimir effect. It's effectively the same thing. Uh, so so the deal is uh, the universe might have. A quantum mechanic processes in the universe might have some basic vacuum energy. But the problem with that is when you add everything up, you end up with an infinite amount of, of, of vacuum energy. And it wouldn't, uh, this vacuum energy doesn't affect quantum mechanic processes at all because quantum mechanics is all about the transition between energy states. And so it doesn't care where the, how deep the ocean goes. It's only talking about above and below the surface of the ocean. Um, so, so the moral of the story is, uh, if you, um, if you start dealing with this and you want to reconcile quantum mechanics with gravity, uh, in gravitation, anything with energy will gravitate. And so you say, well, won't this dark, won't, won't this vacuum energy gravitate? Won't it have its own gravity? Won't it affect the curvature of the universe? Um, and so the first thing people did was they said, well, it's not, the, the it, infinity energy is no good. And so they apply a cutoff at the Planck length, theoretically. So they say, okay, there can't be any of these dark energy or, or, or vacuum energy waves below the Planck length. Fine. Uh, and, and then as a result of that cutoff, you get a very large but finite number for how much vacuum energy there should be per unit of volume in the universe. And, uh, and that's fine, but then when you start doing the calculations, you see that this vacuum energy, it, it behaves in terms of gravitation. It behaves just like the cosmological constant. It has the same type of effect on curvature. And so you go, oh, okay, what if the cosmological constant is just this vacuum energy? Boy, that would be fun. And it would be fun, but the deal is that the, the cosmological constant, its effects are small, right? It doesn't affect, say, the, uh, the orbit of Pluto or the orbit of Sedna, or any of these really you know, far out uh, uh, solar system tests, right? A dark, dark energy barely affects anything at all, uh, unless you're at the scale of, you know, inter, inter, uh, um, <clears throat> galactic size, intergalactic sizes. Yeah, right. So the distance scale between galaxies. So if you're so so so. The result is that there's this like, there's this horrible fall on your face moment where it looks like the people who are trying to uh, describe, discover the reason for the, the cosmological constant, they're saying, hey, it's vacuum energy. You say, okay, fine. Uh, why isn't it infinite? And they go, oh, well, it's not infinite because there's this cutoff. But even if it's not infinite, the, the cutoff is there's still so much vacuum, I mean, uh, uh, vacuum energy in the system, it's 120 orders of magnitude higher than it should be. So it's still a pretty big scandal. Nobody knows what the cosmological constant is or whether or not the vacuum gravitates. And if it does, why there's this discrepancy between what we measure and what we predict. All right, why, why are we talking about that again? That was reason number three, to think that there's not clumpiness in the... Uh... Oh yeah, right. But in that Dark case, energy. yeah, in that case, the vacuum, the vacuum probably wouldn't change depending on where you go from place to place. It should be a fundamental constant, right? Yeah, unless unless physics actually changes from place to place. Yeah, and so if it's a fundamental constant, which we assume it is, at least in the observable universe, um, then it wouldn't clump up anywhere because effectively it would be a constant, like the cosmological constant. Nobody knows. All right. <laughs> Is there anything else to say on this question? I hope that answers the question. I hope that answers the question. I'm sorry, Logan. Please don't cut me with your Wolverine claws. <laughs> uh, sorry I rambled. Anyway, uh, that's probably it for today's question barn, right? Anything else to say, Mike? 
No. All right. Well, um, if you'd like to answer, ask your question on the question bar and send your questions to TIE Fighter, T-I-P-H-Y-T-E-R, at titaniumphysics.com, and we'll... Uh, We'll answer them as best we can. I'm, I'm planning on making more of these regularly because it means I get to uh, hang out with my pals and it means that I get to uh, not edit something. You'll notice that this wasn't edited. It's horrible radio. I'm sorry. Um, all of the Question Bar and Podcast should have a different logo than the Titanium Physicist ones, but they'll be in the same feed. That's so. right. It'll be rated at a half star on iTunes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, our, our iTunes ranking is going to drop precipitously <laughs> because they're going to say, oh, wow, they used to be so good. They used to have three people on and good discussions and uh, pre- preparation. And now it's just, you know, Ben trying to remember the word galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, goodbye, everybody. Uh, See you next time.